for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, ain't no stopping us till we reach the finish line Can hold it down. Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. All in, we came in to win. We're gonna give everything. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K sick, sick. On fire, we're ready to fight. We'll bring the house down tonight. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K sick, sick. S-I-C-K is the sickest. About to listen to the sick podcast. The eye test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy. The Stanley Cup winning Colorado Avalanche 
And after 22 years, Raymond Mark! The sickest NHL podcast. It's going to be sick. Apparently, I got muted there, Pierre. You, uh, you were muted. Were you awake? Were you in the <laughs> game? No, yeah, I usually I'm muted for the intro there, and it just goes off, but I'll do that manually. All right. Uh, welcome again to the eye test here on the Sick Podcast Network. Another Friday here on the eye test. Man, this week flew, Pierre, and, you know, we didn't even have that. Big, big D. Like Dartmouth, Big D. Big D. Reed Cashman did it for him. John okay. Fusco, def John Fusco, defender of the month of the month of March from Dartmouth. Okay, All Toronto right. Maple Leafs draft pick, seventh round in twenty twenty. Yep, uh, I'm thinking off the top of my head, some other NHLers out of Dartmouth. Who who can we crank out here? How about Cooper Black just signed a big That's right. contract? Will become the tallest goalie in the NHL. Six foot eight. Call it in Six foot eight, two hundred forty pounds, signed with the Florida Panthers. Yes, and, but you know. We'll get to that in a bit. I was wondering about that signing period, just given the goaltending depth they do have in that organization. But we can talk about that another time. Tons to talk about from last night. Tons to talk about, Pierre, actually about tonight, too. A very busy Friday night. Mm. Six games. Usually not too many games on a Friday night in the NHL, but six games, six key games as well. So we'll get to that in a bit. But let's start last night. Pierre, you and I were talking when I was on my way over to Bruins practice today. And you made a good observation about the Columbus Blue Jackets and the Montreal Canadiens Blue Lines that they put on the ice last night. You want to tell our listeners and viewers about that? I do. Um, I got up really early this morning. I was doing my traditional early morning film breakdown. And one of the things that really upset me last night was the second period of the Montreal Canadiens, Jimmy, mm -hmm. and how poor they were defensively. They were terrible. They weren't poor. Which we haven't lately. seen a lot lately. No, no, we haven't. But yeah. So I was saying, okay, I'm watching that. Then I'm watching Columbus play against the Islanders, and I'm, I'm kind of seeing a disinterested group, and that's really weird for a Pascal Vincent, Mark Recchi coach team. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm saying, I gotta go look at something this morning, meaning today. So I, I went on and I look at their defenseman that played, and I said, something in my spidey senses is saying, these two teams got issues. There were 18 teams that played last night. There were nine games in the league. 18 teams played. Only two had defensemen playing for their rosters last night that were career minus players. Wow. Only two. Montreal. And Columbus. And Columbus. Wow. So somebody would say to you, well, Pierre, San Jose lost to Los Angeles 2-1, to one, and San Jose only had 16 shots on that. True, I would seed you that, but I would tell you career career plus minus. Mark Edward Vlasic is a plus player, and Jan Ruda is a mm -hmm. plus player. The rest of that defense are all minuses. Right. So when you look at, I'm just saying the entire defense core last night that were dressed for Montreal and for Columbus, both of them were minus. And guess what that tells you, Jimmy? Look where they are in the standings. Yeah, exactly. The, the one thing I would say, Pierre, maybe I maybe more so for Montreal, I wonder, is how much do you have to factor in the youth, though, on that? On no, that? I'm talking career. So okay. I don't worry about that. So I'll give you an example. Mike Matheson's not a young player. Go there. <laughs> yeah, he's not. He's not a young player. Yeah. Hey, David Savard's not a young player. No, well, I'm surprised. I You know, I would have never thought without you telling me that. Well, I no, I was – listen, you know how much I think of the Canes rebuild and where they're going with their management yep. team and, and how one of the organizational strengths long-term is their defense. It Correct. is. Yep. But what I'm telling you is there's a reason why there's a malfunction at the junction for some of these teams. Yes. And for both these teams, that would be exhibit A. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree. And, Pierre, I, you, you talk about disinterest – that was the most disinterested I've seen the Habs play. I beg to say in a, in a month, in, in, in the last month, they have played to me really passionate. We've gone on about this, how passionate they've been out there and how, how, you know, interested, how much they've looked like a team fighting for a playoff spot, despite having no chance at all. And it just, that sort of went out the door last night it, 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 multiple times during that game. So, 
I was a little surprised here, but I guess everybody's, you know, everybody's due to have a game like that. But remember, too, before you go any further, I apologize yep. for cutting you off. Tampa Bay is bringing the heat. Oh, my gosh. They're bringing the heat. So here's the question I have for you and for our loyal viewers and listeners. Mm -hmm. How good is Kucherov? I was just going to go there. And it's going to escape me who it was that he hit behind the net there that the Habs fans were going crazy about saying it was a dirty hit. It was a completely clean hit. No, it was a clean hit. I'm trying to remember who that is. You know what I'm talking about, right? I do. I know the kind of, kind of the side like that. Yeah. And people are saying it was a late hit. He just let the puck go. It wasn't late. I, I think that was more just Habs fans being disgruntled because well, he, how, the question is how he good lit them up a few years back in the playoffs. So How good is the guy? Uh, he's he's unreal. I mean, if not for McKinnon, he's the, he's the Hart Trophy winner. How about Steven Stamkos? How good is he? Steven Stamkos is quite good. Future Hall of Famer, for sure. How good is Braden Point? Oh, my gosh. But. How good is Anthony Sorelli? Yes. Okay. How okay. good is Nicholas Paul? Deep. This team's deep here. How, oh. how, 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 good, how good is Victor Hedman? Very good. Okay. So they've been able to keep star players and build around them with young guys that need to grow. And so you watch Lilleberg play last night. He plays really well. You know, you watch Perbix play last night. He plays really well. You watch Radis play last night. He plays really well. Uh, you watch a guy from your alma mater, Mitchell Chafee. Mm -hmm. Looks really good. Great scouting by the Tampa Bay Lightning. We talked about this yesterday. It's elite scouting. It's elite scouting because they knew they were – this – so when most teams go through transition years – or reset, so to speak, they tend to, you know, drop a bit. Tampa Bay throughout this season has consistently risen. And I think there's one guy you haven't mentioned yet. And, I mean, if he'd been playing this way all year, Pierre, he'd be in the Vesna conversation. That's I okay. mean, he, he's on another planet right now. I don't want to play him in a first round. I don't care if I'm the New York Rangers, the Boston Bruins, the Florida Panthers, whoever. Or, or maybe, you know, who knows? Like, he just – I do not want to go against him in the first round because that has to me – and it, in my eyes, it wouldn't be an upset, but according to, the you know, the, the draft kings, the MGM grand and all that, they're going to be the underdogs, and it's going to be an upset gambling-wise. That's the underdog. That could be the team to watch out for in the first round and maybe even the second with the way he's playing. Do we, do we have a um... – do we have an opportunity to just go look at his draft year? Because you have your computer there. Yeah, I'll bring it up. Bring up his draft year. And we're going to play an exercise that I like to do when I see players that, you know, do well that are later round picks and see who has picked 5, 10, 15 players ahead of them, 5, 10, 15 players behind them. Okay. So, okay, so start with the first pick and just slowly read the names. So this is the 2012 draft. Correct. Okay, we're going to start off right there. Number one, you know, and this could go no, down. Don't make it long. Just say the names. Okay. We're just going to say the names. Here we go. At one, we had Edmonton Oilers taking Nal Yakupov. At two, Columbus Blue Jackets taking Ryan Murray. Three, Montreal Canadiens taking Alex Kelchaniak. Four, the New York Islanders taking Griffin Reinhardt. Five, the Toronto Maple Leafs taking Morgan Riley. Six, the Anaheim Ducks taking Hampus Lindholm. Seven, the Minnesota Wild taking Matt Dumba. Eight, the Pittsburgh Penguins taking Derek Pouliot. Nine, the Winnipeg Jets taking Jacob Truba. Ten, the Tampa Bay Lightning taking Slater Cuckoo. Co Cuckoo. Slater Cuckoo. Slater Cuckoo. Okay, sorry on the mispronunciation. Washington taking Philip Forsberg at 11. At 12, Buffalo taking Mikhail Gurganko. At 13, Dallas taking Radic Foxa. At 14, Buffalo taking Zemgis Yeah. 15, Otto taking Cody Cece. Washington taking Tom Wilson at 16. The Sharks taking Thomas Hurdle at 17. At 18, the Blackhawks taking Teru Teravainen. And then Vasilevsky goes in at number 19. So go look at the top part of that draft. Go look at the second through the fifth pick. Yep. You think there were any bogeys made? Oh, yeah. Quite a bit. 
And you could even argue from eight, you look at 10, even Tampa oh, Bay. Like Morgan, right? Like those guys, legit players. Dumba's a good player. Yeah. You know, Morgan, right? Lynn Holmes a good player. Lynn Holmes a good player. That's what I'm saying. So, but look at, you just did the exercise for me. Yep. How could so many people have miscalculated on the player? I don't know. And why were so many people obsessed with defensemen? Like, wow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight defensemen taken in the top 10 of that draft here before forwards started to really make a splash. But look at some of the defensemen that you're alluding to. And, and no, look at, they were well, drafted. Three of, those, or three of them, maybe I'll give. Other yeah, than that. Well, yeah. Think yeah. about it. Like, think about the draft. Now, Yakupov, I mean, by the way, I don't know if you ever had a chance in your travels to meet him. Awesome kid to spend time with. Awesome yep. kid to spend time with. Really, that's a that's a miss. That's a major miss. Yep, Galchenyuk was a miss. M major miss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you think of? Hold it. Where would? Okay, let's just do this. I'm biting my tongue. You know I am right now. Where so. would the Edmonton Oilers be if they had Andre Vasilevsky all this time? Yep. <laughs> okay, let me ask you this though, Pierre. Well, I, I, agree, I agree with I you. That's unfair. No, I think it's fair. But what I don't understand is why are teams so hesitant to take goalies so high in a top five pick like that? Why is it always no matter how good the goalies are, Pierre? I mean, let's think about since two thousand since since we came back from the nuclear winter. Yep. And I, we don't have the time to go through it. I'm just doing this off the top of my head. And maybe I'll do it over the weekend. We'll revisit it on Monday. But off the top of your head, how many goalies were taken in the top five since the 05 draft? We had Carey Price he in was, that draft. I think, I think it was Carey five or six. He was five. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can't. My, was, my brain was, stops there. Was, I can't think of one. That was a Crosby draft. And and when you do the tail of the tape, then Montreal Canadiens had Jose Theodore, who was an MVP candidate. Okay, mm -hmm. and what was the Montreal Canadiens' pressing need? Big defenseman. Mark Stahl went later. Huge centerman. Anse Kopitar went. Yes. So you can argue, even though Carey, come on, amazing yeah. career, amazing career. But could you argue that maybe Montreal should have drafted Kopitar instead of Price? That, yeah, I think that's a valid argument. still playing. Yeah, that's a valid and argument. And I and I know he's one. And I know I told you the story. David Conti's the one, the former head of scouting for New Jersey. Now he works for Lou Lamar on the Islanders. Uh -huh. I can just tell you right now, David Conti at the 05 World Championships in Innsbruck, Austria, he and I were the only two people watching practice that day. He said, that guy's the best player in the draft besides Crosby. He said, Crosby's number one. This guy's number two. And he nailed it. He nailed it. Yep. He nailed it. Well, I just wonder, I mean, and this goes to the question, and we see it now, right? Are goalies habitually undervalued? They are. So the, what people should have learned, the best draft we've had since 1979, mm -hmm. honestly, is the 2003 draft by, by a mile. Like Joe yep. Pavelski went 205th. Yep. Just, just, look at, just look at the player, where David Backus went, where Patrice Bergeron went, like all these superior players. It's crazy where Brent Burns went, where Mike Richards went, where Jeff Carter went, where Ryan Getzlaff went. I mean, it's just – it's cuckoo. Yep. Shea, Weber, Shea Weber went in the second round. I mean, just go look at it. It's crazy. So the, the best draft before that was 79. It, it, without a doubt, that was the best. But in the 2003 draft, the best draft since 1979, the number one player pick was Mark andre Fleury. Exactly. And and he's, oh, he he's went had to, a nice career, hasn't he? Well, he went to a Stanley Cup final in 2008 and lost. He went to a Stanley Cup final in 2009 and won a game seven where he came up with a stellar save in game seven on Nick Lidstrom. He goes to a Stanley Cup final in 2016, and they split it between he and Matt Murray. Goes to a Stanley Cup final in 2017, split it between he and Matt Murray, and there were big games where Matt couldn't play that Mark andre won on the road mm -hmm. from Pittsburgh. So the guys won three Stanley Cups. 2018 takes an expansion team all the way Stanley to the Cup final. And he's the the franchise. Yep. So, I, I mean, that's a pretty good pedigree. Yeah. And when you consider it, he went number one in what most people consider, if not the best draft, the second best draft in the history of the NHL. I agree. I agree, Pierre.
Well, getting back to the games last night and a goalie that continues to play well, and he was on nobody's radar in his draft, I bet, is Nadalkovich. And the, the, look, the Pittsburgh Penguins right now here, I think they've got to be the story of the NHL. They have to be. For, for the last two weeks, they have been. Yeah, it's just – it's amazing what they've done, what Sidney Crosby is doing. Like, we both agreed on the phone earlier today, if not for McKinnon and Kucherov, he's your Hart Trophy winner. He is literally defining what the, the MVP is, most valuable player, because they are not even sniffing a playoff spot, if not for him right now. And, and the fact that he's doing it this late into his career, that he – He's just literally, he's willed this team into playoff contention. So and they, 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 they're going to, now I, I don't know, like they, they literally could make the playoffs. And I'll eat Major Crow. I wrote him off, but it, it's amazing well, what he's doing right now. So did a lot of people in Pittsburgh. So yep. did a lot of people in the national media. So did, so did a lot of coaches around the National Hockey League. You were one of the few pair that didn't, and, and it was because. Well, but I would never bet against, so why I would never bet against Crosby. That's my whole when I see him, and I told you the story, I sat in a room with, well, actually a hallway, with Mario, Craig Patrick, Sydney, and myself, and Pierre LaRouche. And I'm just telling you, like, you could see, when you he was in that discussion, you could see the intensity, and this was right after Gensel got traded. Like, he was ready to carry the mail. You could just tell from the way he was talking. It was really impressive. But you talked about what Pittsburgh going into Washington winning that game last night, 4-1. Here's one thing I want you to remember. Coaching matters. We say this all the time because I've got a bias towards good coaches, and I get mad at coaches that make a lot of mistakes because it, a lot of times they're doing it because they're listening to people they shouldn't be listening to. Maybe their staff's not as strong as it needs to be. Uh, maybe somebody in the video room <laughs> misplayed something and they got a problem. Mm -hmm. Most of these guys are really, really cerebral and very good coaches. I'm talking about head coaches in the league. Last night at the end of that game, when it really mattered, because Washington was starting to push, the coach had Lars Eller, Jeff Carter, and Riley Smith on the ice. Okay? That's not a line. Yep. But it shows you that Mike Sullivan understands that coaching is asset management. Mm -hmm. And we talked about Mike yesterday. And what a job Mike is doing. Mike's doing a fantastic yes. job. Yes. He's doing because he kept the train on the track. He did. The train almost went in the ditch and blew up. Yep. And he kept it on the track. And and so when I'm watching that and I see Lars Eller scoring through the empty net, I'm going to myself, that's coaching, man. That's what and yeah. nobody acknowledges that. But yeah. that's coaching. Yeah, for sure. And you know, Pierre, I don't know if you remember. I mean, there was a point. I'd say even as recently as early March, might have been the last week of February, but early. I just remember one of his press conferences, and and he he was he was unraveling a bit emotionally, and not not the way you want a coach to. You know, sometimes getting as we've seen, we mentioned Jim Montgomery, what he did. Um, sometimes, obviously, when you let it out and you reel into guys, it can it can help. But it it was a different type of. It was not where you want him to go, and he. I wish I could find the video and I'll try and find it for Monday. And he caught himself like midstream, mid sentence. And you see him take a deep breath. And I swear to God, since he took that deep breath, they have been a different team. It was almost like this isn't going to end well. If I, if I, if I just let it all out the way I'm about to right now, it's not going to channel the way I want. There's ways to channel my anger and there's ways not to, and this is not going to be the way. And he literally, you could just see in his eyes him in, and I noticed that and I said, that's a coach because he realized that he was kind of himself. You said he kept things on the rails. He was kind of going off the rails in that press conference and he reeled it back in. And I, I think that's been key. And then you've seen it translate on the ice. One of the biggest mistakes I see in the NHL now, um, coaches that just go in cold, emotional, without a prepared plan for their press conferences. You have to. So you, I would you tell have you that in between time. You need, you, you need that, but you also need to have a plan in terms of what your message wants to be in the community Yep. because your players are sensitive to what's said in the community, especially about them. And, you know, Torch challenging his team I don't think is a problem. 
But when Torch gets into trouble, it's when he's challenging individuals. Yes. You notice the difference. Mm -hmm. And so I can just tell you from personal experience, Bob Johnson never addressed the media unless he had a debrief with his staff. Scotty okay. Holman never addressed the media unless he had a debrief with his staff. And it was always to make sure everybody understood exactly why certain things were being said and what information they wanted to be in the public domain so that we could be as transparent as possible with the fans, but also make sure that the players were either getting an easy way out or they weren't getting beat down. You don't want to put a target on their back. hundred percent. So, yeah. so that every, and I'm telling you, so it's 82 games plus playoffs, you know, back to back years, you're playing over a hundred games, not counting the preseason games. Yeah. That's a lot of press conferences, but I can tell you that before every one, there was always a message. There was an organizational message that was dispatched. Let me ask you this. And I mean, you don't have to get into details and you don't necessarily have to answer if you don't want, but were there ever times when you were in that debrief meeting right before the head coach goes out there where an assistant coach spoke up and said, don't say that it's not going to go well, or this is what maybe you should say. And the head coach actually heeded that advice and then went out and used it. Did you ever I, see that? I guess it did. Okay. That was, that was the, the brilliance of the Craig Patrick organizations in Pittsburgh when Bob and Scotty right, so you'd go. Was there yeah. empowering the people to do their jobs and not being intimidated by strong opinion. That's why Craig Patrick is one of the finest general managers I've ever been around. And he just figured that out a long time. And I think part of that was when he worked for Herb Brooks. Mm -hmm. I really mean that. Um, their obviously magical moment was 1980. But I think Craig really learned a lot from that entire experience of 80. I really do. And he carried it forward in the NHL. He, he's a brilliant administrator um, and a tremendous believer in empowering people. And I think that's one of the things that's really been overlooked in the new NHL, if you want to call it that. Yeah. No, I love it. I love that they did that. And obviously it was successful for that team. All right. Let's look around, Pierre, at other games from last night. And, you know, the Penguins we've talked at nauseum about, but – I want to go over to the Islanders and Blue Jackets. You mentioned the the defense for the Blue Jackets there, but let's look on the other side of the ice there. The Islanders continue, at least for me, to be one of the greater enigmas of this season. I cannot figure them out. Yes, on paper they should beat the Blue Jackets, but you just never know with this Islanders team right now. No. That, that aside, I liked their effort a lot better last night. I know that you said the defense was weak for Columbus, but that – that doesn't mean that you're automatically going to win. You still got to put the effort in. I was impressed with that effort by the Islanders. Well, it was good. It was fine. The effort was good. And even look at Columbus's effort at different parts of the game was strong. It was. There were other parts where it wasn't as strong, mm -hmm. uh, which was surprising to me because they're on home ice. I get it that when they go on the road, they're probably not going to play that great. They know their season's over. Um, but some of those kids, especially, are playing for jobs. Yeah. So you would think that they'd want to play better. So it goes back to. There were only there were 18 teams that played last night. There are only two, only two that dressed defensemen that every single defenseman had a career minus. Montreal and Columbus. That's amazing. I was I defy anybody. Go do it. That's a great morning. catch. That's a great catch by you. This morning, the only reason I was so ticked off about it, I was watching the games and going, Montreal in the second period stunk. They were bad, and it was their defense, and it was team defense. Yeah. It wasn't just the defense. It was a team defense. So I, I'm going, okay, there's something I'm going to build off of tomorrow morning when I go back and watch the tape. And then I'm watching Columbus, and I'm going, this is no good. There's something stinky here. Mm -hmm. So I went and did them too, and then I said, you know what? If I'm going to do those two, got to do everybody. So just based on the lineups from last night, go do the exercise if you doubt me. Wow. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. It is. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I don't know if uh, Marty St. Louis was trying to pick John Cooper's brain for some uh, defensive advice, but did you see, did you see the pictures going around right now? No. Him and, uh, him and John. Have, I do not have time for doing no, that that's stuff. Right. That's, I'm your social media agent. So I know I'm you are. To you right now. Okay. So a uh, great picture going around right now. Uh, and I know you've been there, Pierre. Cooper and Marty St. Louis hanging out, having a beer, talking with Ziggy at Ziggy's Pub in Montreal. No way. Yeah, after the game last night. Oh, uh, so that that's fantastic. So yeah. first of all, you know Ziggy. Like I oh, know yeah. Ziggy. He's a legend. For those He's that have legend. never 
for those that have never been on Crescent Street in Montreal, you have to go once. You go to Ziggy's. You just walk down the stairs. You ask for Ziggy. He's an amazing man. He's got amazing stories to tell you about his Great earlier pictures all over the wall. Oh. His earlier life, where he came yep. from, and what he had to do. And fascinating man. And boy, oh boy, he should write a book. He should. He should write a book because all he, the hockey people that have been through there, and all the F one yeah. people that have been through there, and that that cool. bar, you know the term when they say if these walls could talk, that's oh. what that book is, eh? I'm glad <laughs> they can't. <laughs> I think too, if I'm not mistaken, Pierre, they uh, they used that when they were filming the um, Build a Spaceman Lee movie. That oh, was, uh, well, was Expo's home bar. They were using it as to film. Yeah, and it was great. Oh, that's neat. Uh, and Ziggy's that's in right, it. For those that don't know, it's right across the street from a very famous place in Montreal called Sir Winston Churchill's. It's yep. right across the street. But it's yeah, it's, it's right at the top. Way part. cooler than George Hills, to, in my opinion. It's just got more history, and it's so cool. Well, it's, just, it's different. You know, they're it's both. Yeah, there's yeah. just they're two different places. I, you know, I, you I always like, know, but yeah. don't forget, we, we like to go to Hurley's too. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you always know you're walking to a good place when you have to walk downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> hey, if Zig's watching, Zig, I miss you. I miss yeah, summer exactly. Yeah, Ziggy. We'll come visit I'll next time. I'll see you, Zig. I'll see you soon. So uh, obviously, the game I'm watching really close. I thought. Maybe the best road game by the Boston Bruins all season, Pierre. They just came Art, out. Start was amazing. Laid it down in the first period. Just just a textbook game, and then they put it in the shutdown mode for the rest of the game. Um, I mean, I'd say the only negative, and it's not a negative, good on him for fighting, but the only negative was John Beecher getting it handed to him uh, by Jack Drury in a college hockey alum fight we don't see many of in the NHL. Yeah, Harvard versus Michigan. Uh, I heard one of the announcers last night say there was a um, wolf, big Wolverine doing some damage till Drury's right hand got free. Yeah. <laughs> and then the crimson was rolling. Hey, it takes guts to do that, as you know. And oh, yeah. The Beecher showed a lot of courage, and I really admire that. Total transparency. One of my favorite players was Jack's dad, Teddy. Mm -hmm. uh, his uncle, Chris, obviously runs the Rangers. Yep. Um, I had the privilege of coaching Teddy in two cities, Hartford and Ottawa. Um, thank the world of the family. They're fantastic people, the entire family. And uh, Jack's a chip off the old block. Um, I remember watching him play for the Waterloo Blackhawks, and he was a really good player there. And I watched him practice and play at Harvard, and he was good there. I watched him over in Sweden when he left Harvard early because of the COVID stuff. And he was over in Sweden and played really well and, you know, I'm not surprised he's doing well in the NHL. I'm not surprised. Well, I'll tell you, I'm wish, I'm thinking Rod Brindamore wishes he rubbed off on his teammates because, I mean, he, he brought it, but the team just didn't react to it enough. Yeah. It just wasn't that there. Was, that's the one time right after because we I think we texted right we after. Texting, yeah. And I was saying the crowd's into it finally yep. because the Bruins had taken the crowd out and they couldn't build off it. They just they couldn't, couldn't do anything. It. You have you know, nights like that, though, Pierre, right? You have nights like that, and that's yeah. why – you're that's right. Tonight, it, you know, I, and like we, we're not trying to advocate for gambling, but if you're a betting person, there's no locks ever in betting. That's why the casinos and the bookies are in business. But this is as close as you get is the Carolina Hurricanes at the Washington Capitals tonight, Pierre. I just, they, I okay. can't imagine what was said to them by Brindamore after that happen. game. And they're going to want to bring it, you know, to impress their coach and say, we know, we know we didn't have it last night. You know what's interesting with Carolina? The one thing, it's the newfangled term, high-volume shot team. That's what you mm -hmm. hear about Carolina all the time. Yes. They were not a high-volume shot team. No. Well, part of that was the way the Bruins played. So mm -hmm. credit to Jimmy Montgomery and the team. They got ready for this road trip, didn't they, Jimmy? Oh, my gosh. That practice got them ready, didn't it, Jimmy? Talking about that today. Prepare yeah, for fun. battle. They yep. got ready, didn't they? So there is some sense that's being set on the eye test, isn't there? Yep. Yeah. They were ready. Uh, but in all seriousness, and all joking aside, kidding aside, I should say, what impressed me about Boston was they took away the speed element of mm -hmm. Carolina's game. But what also really impressed me was the energy that the Bruins played with, which isn't easy to do after some of the emotional games they've had on this trip. Yeah, for sure. They deserve a ton of credit. Yeah. And, and, and just so people know, this wasn't your – 
your normal road trip, um, as we've mentioned a couple of times, but for those that didn't hear, they came home twice during this road trip, which is very rare in the NHL or in sports to see a team do that. And, you know, I said to Pierre the other day, I said, I guess it's good because you'll kind of be doing that in the playoffs, but at the same time, that, that just screws up your routines, your practice routine. Everything's just sort of out of whack. So for them to perform the way they did on this trip, with everything involved with it, with the teams they played, the caliber of teams they played, Pierre, pretty impressive. But, of course, it, it, it's, it's not getting any easier in their first home game back tomorrow. So they'll have the Florida Panthers yeah. where they could either the Atlantic division gets a little tighter or it gets pretty wide. I mean, the Bruins could really, you know, speaking of Florida, up, speaking put, a, put a stranglehold on the division tomorrow. Yeah, speaking of Florida, how'd you like that no show by Ottawa last night? Yeah. I mean, that can't, no, that can't happen. Don't tell me about all the great wins you have on the road. And then you come home and do that. I'm just not surprised. That's, well, that's, I am. I am. Because I, I like the kids on the, that team. I know. I'm not surprised. But I, I just, I want them to do well. It's not that I'm, I'm not trying to, but there's something missing there. And they got to figure it out in the off season. There's something missing. that's allowing that to happen on multiple occasions this year. This was year. I'm watching that. And I'm, I have pain in my heart. Yeah, I'm not supposed to cheer for anybody, but I work with a lot of those kids. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I I remember flying into Grand uh, Forks and trying to get Sanderson to leave and trying to get Tyler Clevin to leave, and you know, I remember when Josh Norris got hurt. I know he's still back hurt again. Timmy stood so all these young guys. They're they're fantastic people. Yeah, they're really really, and they're fantastic players. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. That can't happen, Jimmy. Not not on home ice like that. Not when you're trying to win your fans back. Yeah, it's there's a lot of work to be done there. It's no, that's not an overstatement. There's a lot there, Pierre. Um, but that you know, so those that's really where I was focused on those games, Pierre. I mean, Avalanche five two over the Wild. But before you go anywhere on that one, yeah, Wild played hard. They did. They played hard, but they had no answer. They had no answer for McKinnon and. I'm going to say his name, number 27, Jonathan Durant. They had no answer. Yeah. Durant, Durant, you know, they don't give an award, I don't think, for the most improved player in the league. But well, if, he'll, he's a nominee for the Masterton. But that's, I mean, I'm talking most improved yeah. player. Yeah. Not, most improved player in the league. They should. Not even close. Is yeah. Jonathan Drouin. Oh, yeah. And you know who would probably be second? Yoel Armia. Mm-hmm. Most, yeah. I'm talking just most improved player from last year to this year. Yeah, you it's know, phenomenal to watch Drew. I'm, I'm happy for the kid. I'm, I'm so, so happy for him. him. You know, because look, and I admired him so much for when he was uh, forthcoming about what he's been going through off the ice, uh, just with mental health issues and and just everything he went through. And look, I'm not. This is no knock on Canadians fans and the media. There, it's just what that city is. I mean, they live and breathe hockey, and things things go like a roller coaster there in terms of coverage and emotion and it's just it's just the nature of the business but it, it was obvious it got to him and it was it was hard for him there and to get that fresh start and also too let's not forget nathan mckinnon in this whole story here because he he recruited him he got him there and he he want he pushed to get that kid a, sec, a second or third chance whatever you want to call it um but god bless jonathan drew and for the way he's taken the torch there and run uh, I agree with you. He's the most improved player in the NHL, and he's going to be a weapon for that team in the playoffs, Pierre. He ha he, no, but he has to be. That's where he's at now. He needs to, especially if they don't get Gabriel Landeskog back. Yeah. I don't know if they get Landeskog back or not. I, I just don't know. But if they And how get, good I – mean, you know, it's going to take him a while to get back into game motion too, even if they get him you'd back. Be, you'd be surprised with him. Gabe is such a good athlete and, uh -huh. and he's such a power player. He's a big guy. He's a big, thick person. I don't know how long it's going to take a guy like that. I'm telling you, because he plays a simple game. It's not a. Con it's not like Kucherov. Kucherov is a very complicated, athletic, timing-oriented type player. The other guy is just a pure power player. So I don't know how long it okay. takes him to get back. Because you, yeah. you don't have to transport the puck. Yeah, twenty-nine transports yeah. the puck. That's yeah. You know that's I mean? like, so it's a different. Anyways, we'll see how that goes. What do you got for other? So so San Jose. Yeah, gave an effort. Okay, they did. They gave an effort. They had 16 shots on net. They had 13. I watched it. They had 13 after two periods. They had three in the third. Okay, I'm just telling you. 
you, you usually in the NHL, not always, but usually you score one goal every 10 shots. You usually. Yep. Okay. So if you can't get to 20 shots, you're not winning any games. No. No, it's just not happening. You're not winning games. But they were better. And, and congratulations. They gave an effort. This is my point. Yeah. So they're giving an effort. Now, we talked about Colin Graff signing there. Yes, I want, I want to go there too. Okay, so before we go there, I just want to say one thing. One of the friends of our show is Rand Pecknell, who's done an amazing job as a coach at Quinnipiac. He probably should still be playing, but Boston College just had too much firepower, and they had Jacob Fowler in goal, and they beat Quinnipiac in overtime. Yep. So Quinnipiac in the last week has lost Colin Graff as a junior. They've lost Jacob Quillen as a junior. They've lost Sam Lipkin as a sophomore. And they've lost Filion as a junior in a transfer to Miami of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I did the math today. They scored 160 goals as a team this past season. I'm not counting any of the other guys that are leaving, like Tupker or Lee or McGee. They all scored too. Right. Just those four guys that I told you, they've lost 66 goals. 22 from Graff, 17 from Quillen, 15 from Lipkin, and 12 from Filion. That, like... If you score over 12 goals in a college season, that's a hell of a year. I'm just right. telling you, it's, it's, hard to score. Yep. it's really hard to score in college. So, like, 66 goals, I don't care how much they play in the portal. You know how hard that is to overcome it, that? It's I just, this is. I feel like – so they get that news, and Minnesota gets the news that they're keeping Jimmy Snugger root. I know. For a third year. I mean, that just shows you how volatile college hockey is becoming. Let, let me ask you something up here quickly before we move on. I don't want to sidetrack too much, but I was just talking about it on a podcast I was on right before this, okay. just about how busy the portal's been and how teams are getting hammered, losing players. And obviously there's the other end of the spectrum where they gain. Um, but we, we brought up Northern Michigan, for example, who just 13 players, Pierre. 13 players, gone. Yeah, but I will say this, just to interrupt, sorry about that. They have what is considered by many in the business – a top three to five recruiting class coming okay. in. Okay, just just so you know. Okay. Yep. But no, I'm glad you said it because that's where I'm going. This is the perfect segue. Based on the portal now, and the the higher volume over the years of NCAA free agents going into the NHL a lot earlier, maybe than they used to because of the salary cap and all that. How important? And we talk about how important it is in the NHL scouting. How much more important has scouting become, not just for incoming players in college hockey, but for players currently playing in the sport? Because you have to prepare for all for recruiting, and you have to prepare for portal. How how much bigger? And will will teams expand their staff because of that now? Well, or maybe they, they have. No, they should. I think some have. Um, it's easier for the Big Ten schools and then NCH schools and, and the Hockey East schools because they have bigger budgets. It's easier for them to do it, and they're revenue-producing sports at all right. those schools. So right. plus you have the Big Ten TV contract. You know, I'll give you an example. Boston College is part of the ACC in basketball and football and their other sports, and they're part of Hockey East, obviously, in hockey. They're probably getting a check for just for their ACC stuff for probably 50 to $80 million. That's just for TV. So – the landscape's different for hockey, but here's right. what I would say. And you know, again, just being transparent, we just lived it in my house. Yep. We lived the portal thing through my house. It is the most fascinating thing I've ever seen. The research and the video study and the number gathering that's being done by these schools on these players okay. is phenomenal. So way it's more than when you were coaching there? Oh my gosh, not even close. We okay. didn't have to do that because when I was coaching back then, if you took a kid as a transfer, he had to sit out a year. I'll give you an example. We had the two Lappin brothers leave Boston University and come to St. Lawrence. Okay. Okay. So they left BU and came to St. Lawrence. They had to sit out a year. So wow. they were playing junior hockey in Smith Falls, Ontario, because they weren't eligible to play for us. They played for us the second year. Okay. But they sat out a full year. Yeah. That's what it used to be. So you didn't have to, that wasn't happening all the time. Right. But now – my son's a good example. Like he's finishing at Colgate, and two weeks after he's done at Colgate, he's going to be in classes at Northeastern. Yeah, that's you know that's just it's it's. I will say this on Monday, which was April Fool's Day. I felt as close 
to the NHL as I've ever felt for college hockey, just because I was living it. I was part of it. Yep. That's you what know, I was trying we, to get at. We talked in the morning, and my son and I, and he said, Dad, I, I'm going in the portal. I said, are you 100% sure you want to do that? Because if you do, there's no turning back, yep. and there's no guarantee you're getting a team. You don't know that. You think you're going to get a lot of offers, but you don't know. And he said, no, I'm going in. I said, then you get your butt to your coach's office right now, and you look at my ball eyeball and tell him exactly what you're doing. And that's what he did. Good. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing process, I'll tell you yeah. that. Because I didn't have to do it when I was playing or coaching. That, that, that didn't exist. Yeah, the dynamics have changed for sure. For sure. And we were even talking, Pierre, by the way, too, LIU got three players. Did you see that? They're not done. Oh, they're not done. <laughs> we talked about them earlier. They're coming, man. They're coming. So they have a coach who I'm so proud of. He was on the show. He, he's been on our show. Yep. He works his tail off. He's part of an amazing hockey family. We're talking about Brent Riley. And the thing to me that stands out more than anything else is his ability to communicate with his players that he's keeping the players that he's not keeping, and he does very little to alienate anybody in the process. Mm -hmm. Some guys just get punted, and it's not pretty. Yeah. But he does it in a way which I'm really proud of him. I'm telling you. I, I, I spoke about him on that podcast. I was on the Ice Guys earlier, and I spoke about him because they were talking about lesser-known schools now, maybe being able to get some players out of the portal and, and also are growing. becoming. And I, I went right to LIU. And I mentioned how he's good at marketing too, Pierre, because I don't know if you remember what he I talked do. about trying to sell the school. Hey, look, New York City's right there, you know, and you and the other thing too that I didn't even think about, but I thought about while I was talking to them and I mentioned it, Pierre, is also too, you've got all those NHL teams, which means you've got a ton of scouts traveling through that area that are going to come and maybe watch a couple of LIU games, more eyeballs on the players. And I just remember him, like I came away with that saying, this guy's got a great plan. They're, they're going places, and, and now it seems they are. And all their games are on Sports Channel New York. That's right. That's so, right. I forgot about that. Yep. So the big thing that they have to do there, they got to get into a league. The natural progression for them would be to get into the Atlantic Hockey League. Right. I just don't know if they're going to do that or not. Right. I know that people have visited from the Atlantic League to going. That's at RIT, Holy Cross are in that league. Yeah, great. No, Quinnipiac's in the ECAC. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, no, it's okay. Uh, Robert Morris, um, you know, uh, Canisius, Air Force. So that would be the league um, that they would get into if, if they were admitted. But I don't know if they're getting in or not. I just don't know. Let's see what happens. All right. Before we move over to the comments section, uh, Two more things about last night, Pierre. One guy, not necessarily the game, didn't surprise us. Five two Jets over the Flames, but one guy again. You you just <laughs> you think needs a little more love around the league right now. Yeah, Josh Morrissey. Yep. Man, we we talked about Dowdy. So Dowdy last night in the back to back played almost thirty minutes. He's a little shy at thirty. Played twenty nine. <laughs> I'm just telling people are oh, saying he's too old. So all I'm saying is. And I know in, in Winnipeg, it's, you know, a cause celeb to talk about how great Josh Morrissey is. Winnipeg is not Manhattan, and it's not Chicago, and it's not Detroit, yeah. and it's not L.A., and it's not Nashville, and it's not Montreal, and it's not Toronto. It's not Vancouver. It's Winnipeg. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's bad. It's, it's, just, it's not a big city. Exactly. This guy's so good. Yeah. He's so good. If you were in a bigger market, you'd know him. Do you remember when Teppo Newman played in Winnipeg? How good yeah. he was! Like he was oh, so good. Great. He was so good. Great. Yeah, he was great. If getting Dad enough, remember how good he was. Like T the only reason why Timu got all the pub and Keith got all Keith Kachuk got all the pub, those guys were racking up huge amounts of points. Yeah. Like Solani had seventy six yeah. goals. Yeah, but the defensive guys, they got no love at all. Like nobody yeah. knew how good Freddie Olson was. Nobody knew how good Teppo Newman was. Nobody talked about them because they were yeah. just defensemen. But I'm telling you, you put those guys in other markets. Holy mackerel. They're all over the place. This guy's really good. This Josh Morris is something else. It's great. It's great. And credit to them. I said it to you on the phone. I'll say it here, Pierre. I, I just I love I respect a lot what Winnipeg's been through. We go back to a year ago right now. They go in, they they crap out in the playoffs, and then there's all that turmoil with Chef and you know, Blake Wheeler and the goalie and and all this stuff, the coach, everything. 
they found their way through it. They navigated through it. And I give Shovel Day off. I give Bonus. I give Dave Lowry becoming captain there. Like a lot of these guys. Adam, Adam, Adam Lowry. Adam, Adam Lowry. Time warp there. Florida okay. Panthers. <laughs> Dave made a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> Adam Lowry. I knew it right when I said it too. Um, Adam Lowry, though, I did just a character season, I thought, by the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah. No, I'm a big fan. I, I really hope they do well. Um, I'm happy for Rick Bonus as well, obviously, and, and Scotty O'Neill. But um, the one thing I'd say is, again, they have strong ownership, far stronger ownership than people want to talk about. But it's not a gigantic market. And it's hard because it's Canadian dollars in and U.S. dollars out. It's yeah. That's a hard deal. It's a hard deal. Um, but their team is playing exciting hockey now, and we'll hope we'll see how it translates in the playoffs. But and right now, we'll see. Your guy, I think, is going to get a regular spot in the lineup in the playoffs, and that's Cole Perfetti. I hope so. He played really well last night. Like, he had a great he had a great assist last night. Yeah, you know, I still think in a perfect world, Cole's perfect position is center. But we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. I really, you know, I like Cole a lot. I All right. And, by the way, Predators bounced back nicely from that loss to the Bruins, 6-3 over the Blues. All right, let's get over to the questions here. Do you see, do you see how good Roman Yossi was in that game? Oh, gosh. Do you see – so the, the top line, I mean, when, you, when you're watching Gus Nyquist and you're watching Ryan O'Reilly and you're watching Philip Forsberg, and they're going to town off the cycle. They're going to town off the rush. They're going to town off stretch passes. Yep. The, if those guys don't score, Nashville can't win. I don't care how well Roman Yossi plays. I don't care how well – they get goaltending from UC Sar. I don't care. Without those three guys, they're not winning games. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. By the way, Pierre, off topic. Did your uh, your apartment shake today? Your condo shake? So I was working out, and my brother sent me a text. Is your help shake? And I go, no, I didn't feel yeah. anything. I didn't feel anything either. Everyone's talking about it. Even, like, people. So I thought he was my chop saying, you're so heavy. You're riding the bike, and you're shaking the whole town. That's what I thought he was doing. I thought he was busting my chops. <laughs> yeah, a little earthquake in the Northeast here, Korea. And then we got the eclipse on Monday. And the playoffs are coming. All right, let's switch it over to the questions. <laughs> let's go. All right, Randy Workman. Uh, Jimmy, can you ask Pierre if you – you can ask him too, Randy. You, you, you can ask Pierre if you're assistant coach, what do you do if you disagree with the head coach about a choice before a game starts? That's a great question, Randy. Just say I, I think we got to think about this in terms of matchup situations. Um, and if the head coach says, no, I'm doing it this way, you all leave the room singing from the same songbook. You all made right. your point, didn't work, move on. Okay. But you, If you're an assistant coach and you don't bring up something that you think should be done, you shouldn't be an assistant coach. Yeah. And I imagine, too, that comes up a lot more when there's sudden lineup changes on the other side, too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It does. Yep. All right. Uh, next question. Jimmy Pierre, identify a couple playoff surprises in the eight series. Pierre, we I'd don't know, we don't know what the eight series are going to be. We don't know be. what they are yet, but I did reference that. I mean, I don't want anything to do with Tampa. I think they're. No, I wouldn't want to play Tampa. Yeah. And, you know, everyone's saying the same thing about Nashville, but Pierre just made a real good point there. I don't know if they're deep enough right now. I just don't. Where's Vegas going to finish? Oof, that's very interesting. Because let's just say they drop to a wild card spot. Yep. Somebody might not be happy to be a one seed. Like Ed, yeah, Vancouver, getting them in the first. Vancouver. Yeah, I don't think that would go well for I just, me. Like, I wouldn't want to play Vegas in the first round. Not yeah. when we have everybody back. You know, and the fact that Tomas Hurdle is back skating. Mm -hmm. you know, Anathan's looking more and more comfortable. Petrangelo is, you know, going to be more and more comfortable. I don't know if I want to play those guys. I just don't know if I want to play those guys. I mean – I'm looking at the bottom of the East there with the two wild card slots. Let's just say it's the Lightning and Islanders. Out of those two, you don't want to play Tampa, you know. And then if we look right now, we're just currently speaking. We know things could change a lot. I mean, Pierre just mentioned if Vegas drops, but if you look at Nashville and LA, I'd say uh, that's a tough one. That's a tough I mean, one because I don't know. I don't want to say Kopitar in the first round. I'd be less afraid of either one of those. I wouldn't want to play as a. I wouldn't want to play against Vegas if they were a wild card. I yeah. just wouldn't want to play against them. All right, let's move on. What do we got? Steve Rosen. What will Carolina do next season with so many contracts ending this season? What a, great, a couple people asked about that. Great this question. Yep. 
I that's think that's a gonna, dirty little secret that nobody's really talking about yeah. around the league. That's going to be interesting. Don't know. Yeah. Don't that's know. why somebody was asking, you know, some of these players. Not only that, they got coaching contracts that are running out. Too. Yeah, I think that's going to get sorted out, though. Well, sure. we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. You never do know. You never we'll know. See. We'll see. All right. What do we got? Jeffrey B. With Armia starting to put it together after a stint in the AHL and getting a sports therapist, what kind of value would he have for a contender next trade deadline, if not this offseason? Pierre, I think you spoke about that heading into the deadline. Did you not? I did. I did. Um, but it shows me that some guys weren't paying attention as pro scouts. Yeah. Uh, the value would have been there. Now, you probably could have got him for a fourth or fifth round pick. Yeah. You know, which is a valuable player. Now, is he a player that plays better when there's no pressure on? Because he's doing that now. Yeah. Or is he a player that plays better when he knows he needs to produce? Because if he doesn't, he's probably done in the league. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So there's two different ways to view that. I personally think he's a really talented guy that needs to just have, have a coach figure out how to push his buttons. This year they figured it out. And I was just going to say. They, you know what I'm they figured it out. Diesel fume and fast foods is a clear cure. <laughs> it's a clear cure That's for true. guys who want to be on private planes and stay at the Ritz Carlton. That's yeah. The Motel Six just isn't as comfortable as the Ritz Carlton. This ride from Laval to Belleville is not a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, but well, you're, you know what? Before we go on questions too, if you're ever in the Motel Six or the, uh, the Ritz Carlton, you got a microwave, you might want to pull up one of our next sponsors here, Factor Meals, and heat that up on the road. Uh, why don't we show our logo there for them guys, if we can. And there you go. Factor's delicious, ready to eat meals, make eating better every day easy. Head to factormeals.com slash ITES50 and use the code ITES50 to get 50% off. Again, that's factormeals.com slash ITES50. Use the code ITES50 to get 50% off. And again, another thing you can travel with too, because you want to stay well-groomed. And that's our good friends from Manscaped. Uh, Manscaped is where you go this season to make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders and below the waist grooming. Go to manscaped.com and use code ITES for 20% off and free shipping. Again, that's manscaped.com. ITES is the code for 20% off and free shipping. All right, next question. A to Z me. Lars Eller has silently had a pretty nice career. Nine seasons with 13-plus goals, Stanley Cup winner, played with the Habs, went three NHL legends, Price, Ovi, and Crosby. What are your thoughts about him looking back? I think he's been a great, useful player, good, dependable player up here. I like him. That's what he's always been. He's never been a great point getter. He's always nope. been a checker, but he was sold as a, an elite point getter when St. Louis drafted him in the first round. And when he came to Montreal, he was sold as the same thing. So there was always an expectation of more from him. But if you really evaluated his game, he was an elite checker and an amazingly useful player on a really good team because he didn't need to score. Mm -hmm. He just needed to win faceoffs, check diligently, not turn the puck over, kill penalties, but the biggest thing was at the end of a game, you can count on him. Like last night, Mike Sullivan has him on the ice with Jeff Carter uh, and does a great job along with uh, Riley Smith. Yep. You know, And so that's the kind of player he's. He's been a trusted, valuable commodity on a good team. Pierre, who would, uh, and I don't know if you know this, but I'll just, uh, if you do know, who would you credit? You talk about how he was hyped as an offensive player so much, but you know, there comes a time where a player has to accept Hey, that's not happening at this level, but I still can find my niche. I still have a role on a team. Who's somebody that you maybe know that directed in that way and helped him figure that out and, and accept where he could be in the NHL? Barry Trotz. Yep. That's what I, I figured. Think, I think Barry did an amazing job with him in Washington. Yeah. I was there. I saw a lot of it and really impressed. Blaine Forsythe was part of it. Uh, Scotty Arneal was there for a little while. They did some really good things with him. Really, yeah, really good. He's been three hundred again. Hey, well. Lane, Lane Lambert, Lane Lambert did a really good job there as well. Like I, I think the Washington staff did a really good job with him. Good on them. All right, next question. Cuckoo sixty nine. Do you think the lack of elite picks and depth in this draft is a result of the COVID nineteen pandemic closures? 
and affected young hockey development. Pierre, I'll let you take this. I, I think a little bit. Yeah, I'm not. But this is the end of it. There's no more excuse after this, but I think a little bit. So I, I once talked about why I thought the 2020 draft was going to be so good. And it should have been great, but that was the first year of the COVID. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, if you think back to it, when we had the 08 financial crisis, remember that? Yep. Yeah. So most of those kids were born in 2002. So they were just getting to hockey playing age. Right. A lot of them, hockey was such an expensive port. A lot of kids didn't play. They didn't continue. Yeah. And so what happened was there was a little bit of a deficiency, but it didn't really affect the 02 borns. What it really affected were the 03 and the 04 borns. And so those drafts after 2020, which was affected by COVID, right. 2021 and 2022, they're nowhere near as deep as what they could have been. Okay. And so I think this is the last time we're going to have to worry about that just because of the COVID. I think that this will be the last one. It's funny this came up because I was listening to our good friend Jeff Merrick earlier today, and he brought up maybe the one exception to that, and he's having such an incredible season for the Stars, is Wyatt Johnson, Pierre. Uh -huh. He went a season without playing because of all that. And he's still doing this right now. Like, wow. Good, good on Jeff. Good on Jeff for saying that. We yeah. talked about Dallas the other day, if you remember. Yes. You know, we talked about the kids, especially Robertson and Johnson and how well they're playing. But good on Jeff for bringing it up. I completely agree. He's yeah. spot on. Just like you. You know, he knows all the players coming up for sure. All right, next question. And we got we got about 10 left, so we're going to go rapid fire. Real, real fast, real fast, yep. Sam and Mate, went to the game last night here in Montreal. Big takeaway is – I would not want to match up with Tampa in round one. What do you think of Duclair? Seems like a perfect fit in Tampa. Agreed and agreed. Agree and agree. All right. Next question. What kind of marks do you think there'll be for Tristan Jerry if he's on the trade market? That's from Evan. Uh, one, one to two component uh, marketplace for him. So I'm thinking second round pick and a, and a prospect or just one, maybe a first round pick, maybe. maybe. And, and I'll just say, I think he is going to be on the market. That's just my hunch. All right. Next question. Nash, 26, Pierre, you said recently Iceman would be a good pick for Montreal, but wouldn't Naginler be a more complete player, a physical top six winger that the Habs need? Yeah, 100%. They're both really good players. It's just beauties in the eye of the beholder. The one yep. thing I know about Iceman, he can score a whack of goals. He's going to yeah. score a whack of goals. That's what I know. He's not nearly as physical as, as Aginla. Not not nearly. So right. your point is well taken. It depends. Like I said, beauties in the eye of the beholder. What do you want? You want a two-way guy? that scores or do you want a guy that really scores it's you, you know it depends what you want all right next question enter tap did you anticipate that 25 percent of the coaches would be fired this year seems like recycling coaches doesn't always work out well <laughs> i'm biting my tongue on all that i'm not saying anything. it's a good question but i i don't like anybody getting fired yeah you know, I just yeah, don't like it. And it's, unfortunately, it's a real part of the business. It's just the way it goes. And I think it's it's worse and worse because of the, the cap issues that teams have. As yeah, well. and it also is a lot of general managers have never made this much money before. Yep. They never, I'm telling you, they never have. And so the easiest thing for them to tell the owner is, it's not me. I got him the players. It's him. Yeah. So the coach usually doesn't have a direct pipeline to the GM or to the, to the owner. Mm -hmm. GM does. Yes. All right. Next question. Randy Workman, Jimmy, who wins the Central Division? Colorado. Here? I'm not fighting with it. All right, let's I go. Agree. Ditto. Next question. Justin LeBron, how far do you think Tampa will go? I think at least past the first round. After that. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. They have to stay healthy. They can't have an injury to Hedman, Kucherov, or Stamkos, or Point. Yep. I, I didn't see Vasilevsky, did I? No, you didn't. But because I don't think you'll get hurt. No, he's, he's, he's back. So good, man. He was back. Toronto the other night. I know that people are getting on Toronto. That guy was really good at key parts of that game in Toronto. Yeah. And he was, he didn't play last night. Obviously they gave him a rake. They put in the Tompkins kid that we talked. He's not a kid. He's 30 years old, but they put him in and he did fine. But Vasilevsky is really good. We'll talk about it Monday, but let's say we end up with Tampa in Florida first round. If Ekblad's not healthy for that series, Florida's in big trouble, Pierre. Well, as long as if they could be, here's my thing. If Florida plays Tampa and can play taking two penalties or less per game, mm -hmm. they'll have a really good chance to win. As long as they don't put Tampa on the power play. If you put Tampa on the power play, you're not going to beat them. So if you give them three or more chances on the power play, you're, you won't beat them. You yep, know. with you or not. All right, next question. 
Cuckoo 69 to at least make it out of the first round. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> at least. And you know where they are tomorrow night, too, Pierre. So. <laughs> oh, man. I'm not Your favorite city, one. Montreal. I'm not touching that one. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I was very high in the lease early this season. I am not now. I'll leave it at that. All right. Next question. A, how is Parika on Saginaw and what is his NHL comp? I don't know anything about him. I apologize. We will look it into. We will look. Yep. We'll get on our, our prospect studies pretty soon. We're going to be doing a lot for the draft. We'll get into that later. All right. Next question. Samuel Mate, to build off that point in Carolina, it makes it interesting considering Kokanami is a healthy scratch. Wonder if they try to move him. Hard to see considering he's still young and hard to see considering that cap. That contract's not getting moved. Yeah. Good luck. It's like that. when you go into a store with frying crystal and you push it over, you break it, you buy it. Yep. There you go. All right. Next question. Jimbo Flatfoot. Question Is Green Tree worth the Habs jumping up to get him? A good pick? Well, I don't know. Look, this is early. We don't want draft questions right now. We're, we're worried about the playoffs. Yeah, we're, and we're, we're still stuck in college hockey no, playoffs. People, well. people, people have to understand, like, we're not just throwing stuff against the wall to see if it sticks. If we tell you something, it's because we did the research. Exactly. You know how much tape you have to watch of guys to really know whether yeah. they're good or bad? Yeah. Like We're watching the NHL. We're watching the American League. We're watching college because that's kind of in our domain right now. Right. I love it all for you, but I, I'm just not going to lie. I'm not going to make stuff up. And, and you know what? Good on Pierre for saying that, and I 100% agree, and I'm proud of that about this podcast too because, Pierre, I'm seeing so much stuff out there with people, and then I'm like, I talk to them. I'll, I'll you know, I'll say to them, hey, so what? you you saw this guy play. Huh? What did you think? No, I didn't see him play. Well, what are you writing on him for? I just – it's oh, – four, right. four years ago – I was reading a scouting report online about a player that I had coached when he was a kid. By the way, Jimbo says, sorry, Jimbo, no, no need to apologize there. No, we don't just, apologize. We we're just, just going to gonna nail it for you. We just want to give you a good answer. So we're just going to tell you when we're not ready to do we're not. We're not going to lie to you and make stuff up. But anyways, I was reading a scouting report on a kid that I had coached for a long time. Oh, geez. In the summers. And they were talking about he was a big, physical, mobile guy. Uh-huh. And I was like, well, the big is wrong, the physical is wrong, and the mobile's wrong. <laughs> so who wrote this report? And then I started seeing this report going around. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, somebody's making this up. It's, it's not accurate. Yeah. I couldn't believe it, actually. Oh, yeah. And then I just said, you know what, this is, I get it. It's just the way the world is working now. It's okay. It's, it's tough. It's tough. And it's not, but it's not, it's not okay. And it's not fair to the kids, especially when they're still kids. No, like well, that's, that's why we will never, if we don't know, we're going to tell you. Yeah. But we like need if, to, to really get an opinion on a player. You got to watch a lot. Yeah. Like if I make a mistake on a game that I was kind of breezing through, because I'm covering the Bruins last night in the NHL level, well then so be it. I mean, I'm going to own it. Yeah. But I don't, I don't even go dare go through something that I didn't watch at all. You What's know? the one thing we've been so sure? Lead pipe since Macklin Celebrini is the best player in college hockey. We said yep. that from, and we'll and you know what? Our good friend Kevin Paul Dupont wrote it in the Boston Globe. Yeah. Get off our show. Yep. Good stuff. That was back in what, October? Yeah. And I can't yeah. wait next week, Pierre. The Frozen Four starts. Oh, can't wait. man. All right. Oh. I think, what do we got? A couple left? Enter top. <laughs> No, but you know what? You would take Natchez in a second. You'd you take would. Natchez in. I just don't. I don't know how they do that. I don't know. Well, like, it's, it goes take, back to the money issues, the contracts. Yeah, all the money and, and the contracts that are up in Carolina. But, but Martin Natchez worked in Montreal. You're, gonna, you're yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, he'd be great. Yeah, he'd be I just good. think that if there's one guy that they've absolutely identified that we cannot by any means lose, it's him. Yeah, and, I don't see how that – but you never know. I don't. You know. never know. I've seen crazier things happen. All right. Next question. A to Z, me. Crazy race to see which teams make the playoffs. Pens, Caps, Flyers, Isles, Wings. My money is on Crosby and Wa getting their teams over the edge. So I'm, I, don't bet against Sid. I don't bet against Sid. Jimmy knows that. I've told him that forever. I just don't bet against him. I'm still not writing Detroit out, though. I think I'm not either. Big right. game tonight, Pierre, against the Rangers. I know. Huge game. At home. In one on a Friday night. One thing working for the for the Wings and that too. Besides what you just said, excuse me, Rangers coming off a very emotional game with the Devils there and all the stuff that surrounded it. 
potential maybe for a little letdown. I know these guys are professionals, but they're also human beings. That's can all. I just, can I just let you in on one thing? Yeah. And this is for all our viewers and listeners. I talked to somebody today for a long time that's very close to this situation, Rangers mm -hmm. and Devils. I won't tell you what side of the equation they're on. Okay. And he said at some point there's going to be more stuff coming out. Not in a bad way. Interesting. But it's just decisions that were made and why they were made by a coaching staff in that game and not, not in a bad way. Like I don't, it's nothing nefarious, but when you look at it after the fact, you say, okay, that makes sense. That makes right. sense. Yeah. makes total sense. Why you would think about doing that, or they would think about doing this. A lot got misconstrued in this whole thing, but it was a fascinating, I, I did a lot of listening. I was really fascinated by it. it oh yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. So many good. different takes across the league. It was good stuff. No, that's what I'm saying. So you and I had a take. Yep. I thought we were fair to both sides because we yep. said there's one side, there's the other side, and then there's the truth down the middle. And the thing that I heard today was more down the middle. Okay. And, but it, it explained a lot of why certain people were on the ice mm -hmm. and other people were not on the ice. All right. Look we'll forward talk to that. About it as we let everything calm down a little. Exactly. All right. But I do like Detroit tonight. All right. Next question. Alex Avec, would it benefit – Montreal more to take a D man if it's the best player available and trade him for a forward. Could I don't know why not? I mean, it, it, most of these guys are three to five years away anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But you still want to have the very best player you can. I the one thing I'd say, if Cole Eisenman or Ginler are on the board still, mm -hmm. if you're Montreal, you're probably thinking that way just because you're yeah. going to be overwhelmed with depth on defense. You really are. For sure. And I think they, but they did do that here and we've discussed it already. They did stockpile the defensemen and the picks because there might come a time where they could use it to address other needs. Yeah, that's all fair. They made one mistake and it's not this management team. You know, you had to choose between Cockney Emmy and Kachuk. That's right. And I, I look at it. it something I got a lot wrong too. Yeah. You know, everybody, I got a lot wrong too when I was doing that. But that was one that just stood out. That was such an egregious bogey. That was a big, big, big mistake. Yeah, agreed. Big All right. Mistake. Next question, by the way, but they're in a much better place now. I'm happy for them. All right, next question. Should Hughes buy out Gallagher or Anderson? I would buy – if you ask me about buyouts, I wouldn't buy out Gallagher. I'd, and I'm, I'd buy out Anderson if I could. I would buy out Anderson. Well, here's the one – I want to caution everybody on this because it's really important. Everybody thinks buyout is the quick fix to everything. First of all, you got to sell it to your owner, especially in a Canadian market. It's it's real. It's hard money. It's U.S. money. It's not like it's it's not on par. It's a su substantial cost. Mm -hmm. And so I don't. You got to factor that in. So I, I'm not saying that Jeff Molson wouldn't approve it, but if you were to ask me which, I was really disappointed in Josh Anderson's game last night. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Really disappointed. He needs a fresh start somewhere else. That's I think he probably does. I think that's a fair way because I just I like the person and I used to really like the player, but for whatever reason, it's not working in Montreal. And just a, a key thing on that topic of buying out right now, not that they have any buyouts right now, but currently for next season, they are retaining money. That's the Canadians we're speaking about. Jeff Petrie at 2.3 yeah. and Jake Allen at 1.9. That's only for the next season after that. They're all clear when it comes to buy out and retain money. They they will be at 6.8 right now as we speak, but that will go down for next season. Great intel, Jimmy. That's really strong. Good work by you. Really good. Thank you. All right. Next question. A, does Pittsburgh get in? Yes. I, I think with Sid they will, but – you know, last night was a monumental – so you look at it. I mean, you seriously look at it. You're going to New York, you're going to New Jersey, and then you're going to Washington. That's three and four nights. Mm -hmm. Not easy, especially the back-to-back -back with Rangers and Devils. Like, that's it's hard. To play at the level they're playing right now, Pierre. And Sid's just at another – Physically and emotionally exhausted. What Sid did in New York, what Sid did in New York – Three days ago or four days ago, and that's unbelievable. Like, yeah, come on. Yeah, this is nuts right now. This is it's, it's a great story. All right, final question. Arbor, did lack of response after the Ghoulie hit yesterday worry you? I'm not sure if you touched on it or not. I didn't see it. I'll let Pierre address it. Yeah, no, I, okay, 
I can see how it bothers some people. I didn't. I think it's one of those where you just keep it in your back of your mind and you take care of it down the road. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Pierre, what are we uh what are you focused on tonight, my friend? Uh I think I'm having dinner with my wife. Oh, hey, that's a great thing to be focused on. Good and for then you. I'm watching, and then I'm watching hockey. All right. And what's what's on the menu? Do we know? Uh we do. Nice. You want to divulge or no? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, it's it's good. But I'm, I got a nice new Melanie, Melanie, Melanie cooks very well, so I'm very excited about that. Beautiful. Yeah. I got a nice steak and some asparagus waiting for me. I'm looking forward oh, to it. Asparagus is part of our dinner. There you go. It's good stuff. Hold All on. right. Well, thank we you. Have more, we have one more question. Stop it. We do. I, I was do told we? that was it. Oh, is it? Okay. Is that it, guys? Yeah, that's oh, it. Good. All right. We're, we're good to go. I want to thank everyone there for all their questions. Uh, oh, and thank you to Jason Logan saying have a great weekend. Yeah, we wish everybody a great and safe weekend out there. Uh, production crew, as always, great job. Got some guests lined up for next week, Pierre. Uh, one of them, I will. Uh, I, I feel free to tell you that we don't know the day yet, but uh, NHL player agent, and he's all over social media. He does a great job of promoting oh, his gosh. players. Alan Walsh, Montreal man, join us here on the eye test at some point next week. We'll have more details on that, hopefully Monday when we get on the air. Uh, but until then, everyone have a great weekend. Enjoy the hockey. And thanks for listening to the eye test here on the Sick Podcast Network. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the eye test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.